everyone. Welcome back to the clinical track. Um, our next lecture is by Bitta Ashgari. She is a graduate of SCCO. She did her residency in cornea and contact lens at The Ohio State University. Um, I would like everyone in chat to congratulate her. She was nominated for top doctor by the National Care Conus Foundation in 2021. I think that's really great. And I'm so excited for her to teach us how to overcome some issues with scleral lenses. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Bita Ascari, and today I'll be giving a talk titled Overcoming Scleral Lens Failures. So some of the objectives for this hour-long talk today will be to learn how to set up for scleral lens success in your practice, review some of the common causes of scleral lens failure, and end with a nice case review of scleral lens failures and how each of those failures or potential failures were overcome. So let's get down to the very basics of what this piece of plastic is and what the scleral lens is capable of doing. So how does it work? Well, a scleral lens, it lands on the white part of the eye or sclera. It is, because of that, a larger diameter lens. It is made up of a similar, of a rigid gas permeable material as uh, your corneal gas permeable lenses. It can range anywhere between 14 to 23 millimeters in diameter. A true scleral lens is one which will land completely on the white part of the eye, but there are smaller versions of it, mini scleral, et cetera, that you may be familiar with as well. There is a fluid reservoir on the back surface of the lens and the cornea. There is a fluid reservoir in between, which provides constant lubrication. And so this entire system of a scleral lens on the ocular surface helps to mask corneal irregularity. It provides a physical barrier and provides constant lubrication to the ocular surface. So some of the clinical indications for this for your patients would be to try and improve their vision, improve their comfort, or support the ocular surface. And for some of your patients, you may find that they may benefit from all three of these, or any combination of these really is some of the indication that you would see for your patients. And a subcategory of conditions which would benefit from scleral lenses would be your patients with irregular corneal shape. So this is your ectasia patients or post-transplant patient. This is going to be the most common indication in a common spiral lens practice. And then you have your corneal dystrophies and corneal scarring, be it from trauma, a prior herpetic infection, any type of insult to the eye which left an irregular shape, which now warrants a specialty contact lens to see better. So these are some of the other indications. One thing I didn't add in here is a refractive indication as well. So if you have uncorrected refractive error, whether you're a high myope or a high hythrope, these are becoming increasingly common indications to wear scleral lenses as well, in situations where other contact lenses or spectacle modalities may have been insufficient. This is the bread and butter of our clinical practice at Boston site uh, where I work in the clinic. Our bread and butter is really fitting these patients for ocular surface diseases. And some of you may be familiar with the utility of scleral lenses for that, but some of you may not. Uh, so the really, there's a vast, uh, range of the different conditions you can fit spiral lenses for in the ocular surface disease category. But to put them in four simplified categories, you have your case sicca or dry eye disease, your neurotrophic corneas, exposure, and lastly, but certainly not least, limbal stem cell deficiencies. That was a very quick synopsis of what a spiral lens is capable of doing. So there are many patients in your practice which may potentially benefit from this. But before we dive into fitting anybody with a lens, there is one fundamental first step, which I am a firm believer of, and that is to determine candidacy at a consultation visit. Now, doing a consultation visit may be something that you are already practicing in your uh, practice setting, but even if you are doing that, what I hope this lecture will give you is how to really set up a good foundation at the consultation visit so that you can be successful, maximize your spiral lens successes and minimize the failures. So what do we do as part of a spiral lens consultation? First and foremost, you do a clinical assessment. That's just the simple looking at the patient, evaluating their uh, clinical presentation. You also have to review their case and talk about their history with them of what they've been through before. And lastly, of course, there has to be some type of indication. Thinking back to that slide you saw earlier, is there indication to improve vision? Is there indication to improve comfort or support the surface of the eye? It all starts with this initial first step. And again, I can't stress this enough. If you set the appropriate expectations, you will be much more successful down the line. 
If this step is missed or if it's not as comprehensive as it should be for the patient, patient to have a thorough understanding, oftentimes this can lead to a domino effect of problems, lack of patient motivation, unable to apply and remove a lens, et cetera. We'll start by talking about these two here, clinical assessment and scleral lens indication. And really the clinical assessment when you're looking at the patient in a lot of ways will help you determine what the indication would be. If the patient has significant uh, corneal staining and they have a persistent epithelial defect or they're at risk of a melt, et cetera, that says that there's indication for supporting the surface of the eye. If the patient is telling you that they're uncomfortable or they're unhappy with their vision, then what you do is you depend on your clinical assessment to determine if this patient is going to be an appropriate candidate. So these two parts really do go hand in hand together. When you're looking at a clinical assessment or what you should be assessing, the rule of thumb is 2040 or worse is when you consider a scleral lens. I always tell my patients though that it's a lot easier to take them from bad to good than it is to take someone from good to great, which is why 2040 is good, it's not great, but it's good. And to try and meet above that to get better than that can be very challenging. So with that in mind, you know, some patients are willing to take that chance to go from good to great. So it's just a conversation you have with them of how motivated are they? What are the visual uh, limitations they're having with the way they are right now? And does going for a scleral lens make sense for them, even if they are seeing 2040 or better? The corneal health at baseline is one fundamental variable to consider in your clinical assessment. Let's say, for instance, this patient has diffuse corneal edema at baseline. We know that a spiral lens can induce edema. We know that it is a hypoxic variable on the ocular surface. This would be a serious a relative or complete contraindication to wear the lens, depending on the severity of the edema. The aperture width and height and the lid anatomy in general, this is an obvious limitation you have to consider. Some tarsorophies are workable around where you can still get lenses in, others not. So just keep that in mind. And other things like anatomical obstacles. If you have a huge bleb on the, on the conjunctiva overlapping the limits, this is obviously going to be a limitation and not a candidate. And then dexterity, this one is a little bit of a gray area as well, because even if a patient can't apply the remove the lenses themselves, they may have a live-in relative or friend or there may be other means that you can try to get the lens to work for the patient. So now let's talk about case review or history and what other prior therapies have they tried? And your, for your patients with ocular surface diseases, have they tried other therapies, the hierarchy of conventional um, ocular surface disease management? Have they tried lubrication, steroid, immunosuppressants, or stasis, et cetera? Have they tried all these things? And the reason this is so important to review is because all these variables, the fact that if they tried these or not, will influence their motivation and their likelihood to be successful with the scar lens. Again, there's a lot of gray area with all of this, and this is where you have a conversation with them and say, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, these are the different options for you, and you let them make an informed decision. I will tell you, this is a very critical part of every single consultation visit we do, because we recognize if a patient has not tried these other therapies and they dive into a scleral lens possibly prematurely, that is going to lead to increased likelihood of failure where the patient's not motivated to apply and remove, they'll self discontinue wear, et cetera. And as I've been saying all along is setting yourself up for success by setting appropriate expectations with your patients. In addition to everything else I just spoke about, you have to make sure the patients are aware that this type of scleral lens will warrants daily hygiene. You know, if somebody's like, hey, I'm an Olympic swimmer, okay, and you want to see better, maybe this is not necessarily the best option for you. Let's talk about something else because contact lenses and water don't go so well together. For getting more specific into the different categories of diseases like ectasia, you have to, again, talk to them about appropriate vision expectations. They could say, doc, I'm sick of the shadowing in my vision. I really want that gone. You could say, look, I think we can do a lot better. I can't promise I'm going to eliminate it completely. And for your ocular surface disease patients, for instance, you're going to say that you're going to meet their comfort and improvement of the ocular surface or support of the ocular surface goals, but there may be side effects of wearing the lens. Their tolerance to wearing the lens is going to depend on the condition of the disease. They are going to be susceptible to fogging or debris accumulation. And that is one thing I seriously convey to patients. I always say the worst type of patient you get for spiral lens candidacy is a 2020 uncorrected mild to moderate dry eye patient, because now you're going to put them in a lens 
and they've never worn contacts before, let's say, and now they may have other problems like fogging. So it is a little bit of a trade-off in these situations. And again, having that conversation is so important. And this is a collaborative effort. They're going to put in the time, I'm going to put in the time, but this is really going to take some homework for them to be able to be successful. So are you guys ready to fit all these patients, all these wonderful indications, all these wonderful eyes and take care of all your patients? Well, if you are, let's take a look at what you need to be successful for that. You need to, again, patient needs to be able to apply and remove. They need to be able to see. They have to be able to tolerate the lens. The fit has to look pretty good and it has to be adequate. And the physiologic function is one where we're going to talk, we're going to be talking about in more detail in the upcoming slides. So what is the secret ingredient though, out of all those different components I said, it truly is understanding the underlying disease because ultimately you have to know where you are with this disease to understand where it could potentially go and what the potential complications would be. Again, going to your two buckets of conditions, irregular corneas versus ocular surface disease to really generalize this and how to talk to your patients. In your patients with ectasia, they may ask, how often do I have to get refit? Do I have to get my lens prescription changed periodically? And well, you tell them, yes. I mean, as the disease changes, then the fit may need to be changed as well. And these patients in particular are susceptible to contact lens overwear. So they may wear them 16 hours a day, 20 hours a day, et cetera. You have to tell them that, you know, this is not a conventional number of hours to wearing the lenses. Some people do it just fine and there's no issues. But, you know, letting them know that these patients, that there may be uh, consequences to doing this is also really important. For your ocular surface disease patients, the disease state, again, is going to impact how they're able to tolerate the lens with, the lens wear, excuse me. So, again, understanding that these patients are more susceptible to fogging is also very important so that you're laying down an appropriate foundation as these patients are going through with the fitting process. And why is understanding the disease so important? Because the fit can impact the disease and the disease can impact the fit. So really you have to learn to differentiate what a lens problem is, what a fit issue is from what a disease problem is. And again, we're gonna dive into this a little bit further. So now diving into the common causes of star lens failure, again, it's the same stuff we were talking about that requires it to be successful, right? So limitations in application removal, uh, poor vision, poor fit. So for application and removal, you know, sometimes because of the patient's natural anatomy, you may pick a smaller diameter because you wanna make it easier for the patient. But really I find that the most important part of being successful with application removal, yes, the diameter makes some of a difference, you know, a 14, nine millimeter versus a 23 is gonna have a significant impact on the technique. But if we're talking about your normal scleral lens size, um, anything like smaller than 18, 19, it's really about optimizing the fitting technique for the patient in office. So what happens with a lot of these patients is they may get one training, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they get the lens in, you're like, off you go, and good luck with that, and, and you're going to do fine. Well, a lot of these patients don't do fine. They need to understand bubble identification. They need to understand um, what it means if they get a bubble, what it means if they apply and remove incorrectly, et cetera. And that is something in our clinic we really practice and solidify in our patients because, again, we understand just as much as it's important to set an appropriate foundation at the consult visit, it is equally important to set an appropriate foundation for their education and their ability to continue to wear their lens independently. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but if you have a patient who would really be successful or, excuse me, would benefit from a spiral lens, but they're unable to apply and remove, then you can consider talking to them about live-in relatives or friends who may be able to help them with that, et cetera. For, for almost every patient, there are going to be two different categories of limitations or challenges when you're trying to teach them to apply and remove. Number one is a physiological challenge for patients to have a Bell's phenomenon, which is a normal reflex. And we recognize that this can decrease after you use an anesthetic. But this is something that is, um, you know, when their eye rolls back when you try to put a lens on can be challenging and can lead to ultimately lens failure if not trained properly. And then there's a the psychological challenge of, you know, I can't get this lens on my eye. This big piece of plastic is coming at me. How am I going to do this? I tell patients, listen, if I can do it, you can do it. So with that, you know, I'm very careful to not focus on the diameter of the lens. 
you know, none of my patients ever ask me what size lens I'm putting on their eye. They just learn how to apply and remove, and they really don't question it because I don't focus on it, so they don't focus on it. And with appropriate technique, like I said, they can get them in. The biggest thing I want to say about this slide is the fear of the patient comes from the fitter. What do I mean by this? If you're afraid in applying and removing the lens, if your hands are shaky, if you're saying, I don't know if I can get this lens in your eye, patients absorb all this. So just be mindful that when you're applying or removing, you're doing so with confidence. And if you're having some challenges, you can try to put a drop of anesthetic, and then that might help the application technique to improve. And that really does boost the patient's confidence. So just be mindful of that. Vision, really the potential for the patient and limitations should be determined at the consult visit, but there are a number of other reasons they may have limitations in vision, residual refractive um, error, higher order aberrations is a big one for your patients with corneal ectasia and irregular corneas. Fogging is a huge one as I've been talking about throughout this uh, talk, especially for your ocular surface disease patients. The fit one is pretty straightforward. You have to make sure you have corneal and limbal clearance. You have to make sure there's adequate haptic alignment. Consider, should you be in a toric design over your possible spherical fit there you're already in? And then the last thing is, you know, this one is not talked about as much, but I think, you know, it's one that I focus on significantly in clinic is, is there suction with the fit? The different part about suction is, you know, when it comes to corneal clearance, limbal clearance, haptic alignment, you appreciate all that while the lens is on the eye. Suction is really only something you can appreciate once the lens is off the eye. And once the lens comes off the eye, you look for things like rebound redness, corneal edema, specifically you may see limbal microcystic edema. This is a sign that there is potentially suction with this lens. And then patients may describe like an achy sore eye. This is suction uh, potentially, it could be you know impingement, etc. as well. But just be mindful that there, this is a real variable in spiral lens fitting. So if you do assess this, you should be loosening the fit for your patients. How you get an appropriate fit, of course, there's multiple different ways to go about it. You could do a conventional trial lens based, image guided fitting, impression mold technology. You can add specific features to your lens design with like a notch, uh, vault over anatomical obstacles, or put a back surface channel. And of course, you can add fenestrations, which we'll dive into a little bit in this lecture as well. Tolerance of lens wear really is based on, based on patient symptoms, and it is quantified in, often by their average wear time. But when they say, doc, I can only wear it six hours a day because my eye gets uncomfortable, now we're saying that's tolerance of wear that may be limited by something. And it can be limited by the fit, and it can also be limited by the disease. So I always tell patients also right up front, they ask me, doc, how many hours am I going to wear the lens? Am I going to wear this 12 hours a day? I say, I don't know yet because the eye will tolerate what the disease allows it to tolerate. If the patient's eyes look anything like this, where they have significant conjunctival scarring, actually, as well as corneal scarring, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to guarantee that they're going to get 12 hours of wear. I'm going to set appropriate expectations. Physiologic function. Uh, so tolerance of wear is based on patient symptoms. Physiologic function is based on clinical signs, primarily of the cornea and the conjunctival. This is really also assessed once the lens is removed because you're looking for things like in this picture on the top right, corneal bullae, edema, staining of the conjunctiva, et cetera. So this is also fit and disease dependent. So depending on what the eye can tolerate and depending on how the fit looks on the eye, this will dictate how the eye responds. And it ultimately does impact tolerance of wear, which we would expect. So talking a little bit more about what poor physiologic function is. Let's say this is a patient who comes in, they're wearing this lens, they're really happy. They have no real complaints. They're like, you know, my, my vision's good. I can wear this lens, it feels fine. I can wear it 12 hours a day. And you leave it at that. I would say there's a, you know, there may be some temptation and this may be common practice to leave the lens on and say, well, I'm happy you're doing great, Mr. Jones. Keep doing what you're doing. But the whole point of assessing physiologic function is to make sure that the eye itself is responding well to the lens. And even if a patient is not symptomatic today, they may not, first of all, they may not know what to tell you. Maybe they're not telling you what the eye feels like once they've removed the lens. That's what the physiologic function of the eye really represents, how the patient feels 
when they've removed the lens it is a big part of it. Having appropriate physiologic function is going to leave the patient successful, not only for today, but it's going to leave them more successful down the line to, for, to hopefully wear lenses for years to come. So let's say you do remove this lens, though. Obviously, these are not going to be pictures of the same eye, but let's say, for instance, this is what you see. This is a significant impression ring left over. This lens was fitting so tightly that it actually looks like the lens is still on the eye. And you can see with it, there's rebound hyperemia. So this would say this is a poor physiologic function, even if this patient were to come in and have really no complaints. This is a patient, what could possibly happen if they're wearing a tight or fitting lens for years to come? This is actually a real patient I saw in clinic who was wearing a lens that they really had no complaints with. They were wearing, it was fit elsewhere, but they had no complaints with it. And they come in, they're like, I don't even know why I'm here. My doctor sent me over here and said, I need to get refit. Even at this point, with this level of corneal neovascularization and uh, undoubtedly some limbal stem cell dysfunction, this patient really had no complaint, but this is not sustainable. This is poor physiologic function. And lastly, of course, if you get things like corneal edema, this is obvious poor physiologic function and not sustainable long term. So the point of this is to always remove the lens. I really, truly cannot stress that enough. And again, to address the fit as well as the disease of the eye. So now we're getting into more details and we're gonna be diving into some cases in, in just a moment here. But before we do that, let's take a look at how in literature they have talked about the rate of spiral lens failure in the past. These are just four different studies that I found and the uh, failure rate ranged anywhere from 10.4 to 38% depending on the study. Now, why is that? Why is such a big variable? Well, really because what, they defined as failure was different in every single one of these. So one study, they said if they worked for less than six hours, that was considered failure. Mm, I would say that's debatable. It depends on the patient goals, et cetera. But I think what they were saying is that the tolerance of wear, if it was less than six hours, it was, it was considered a failure. And we'll talk about how to improve tolerance of wear, et cetera. In another study, many patients reverted back to corneal GPs or they self-discontinued wear or they were referred for surgical intervention. Really, these are all things based on what we talked about in the slides that can either be determined at the time of the consultation visit, their motivation, or they need to be managed with application removal training. And in the other studies, they either had lack of vision improvement or they couldn't get the lens in and out. And this is a direct quote from this study, the large size of the lens was intimidating. So again, these are all workable things, and any of them, or many of them, I should say, could be kind of worked out at the consultation visit with a good, solid foundation. So ultimately, as I said, what is defining failure? In those other studies, they were defined, each of them were defined differently, but I would really define failure for any of your patients as simple as you're not meeting their goals. So sometimes you need to, again, have the consult visit, identify appropriate goals, and then you're really going to minimize your likelihood of spiral lens failure. And with that, we're getting to the fun stuff, the case review. At the time, she was 13 years old, has keratoconus, has had cross-linking. Vision is obviously reduced, left eye worse than the right. This uh, young girl had a um, history of having no improvement with glasses or other contact lenses, and she had failed spiral lenses because they had such a difficult time applying and removing for her. So at this point, this patient has the clinical indication, she has the history of failing other treatments, and she's really, at least her mom and her, were very motivated to try and get her to be successful with something else. So what I did for her is I tried to put another lens on. Let's just see what, what, the, what the big deal is. And boy, she had a very strong blepharospasm, and she had a very pronounced uh, Bell's reflex as well. So this posed that physiologic challenge that I was talking about earlier with application removal. And what do we do with the physiologic challenge if we're unable to apply the spiral lens? We applied the drop of a paracane. I thought, okay, what? Well, at the very least, I need to see how the lens looks on your eye. This will make the patient also feel that this is possible to put a lens on. For this point in the consult visit, this will be helpful. Well, to my surprise, I couldn't apply the lens still. So at this point, I recognize it is a psychological challenge with this patient and not necessarily physiological. So that got me thinking a little bit outside the box. What am I going to do? I said, okay, going down the list of different things we could try. I said, mom, are you willing to apply in the roof? 
I'll tell you, this 13 year old girl was not interested in that. So that was not going to happen. She didn't want to allow it. And honestly, the mom wanted the, wanted her teenage daughter to have independence. So now I thought, what else can we do? Well, I had the patient try to apply. And to our pleasant surprise, she was successful on her first attempt. We fit her in 17 five millimeter lenses. So they were not mini sclerals, they were modest size. Her vision was 20-20 in each eye right off the bat. And she was able to wear these lenses for 14 hours a day on average. And I will tell you, it's been over three years now and not once have I been able to apply the lens on her eye or remove, and I'm perfectly okay with it because she's doing so great. So this was somebody who would have been a potential failure but thinking outside the box and you know, recognizing how motivated she was with the appropriate goals, we were able to overcome it and prevent failure again. This is another case of a pediatric patient, an eight-year-old Asian female. She had a history of VKC right worse than the left. She had a shield ulcer that manifested a persistent epi defect, which was present for four plus months at the time that she presented to our clinic. She had tried a multitude of different therapies without improvement, including spiral lenses, where she was unable to apply and remove and neither were her parents. She had a history of steroid response, which posed a significant challenge in the management of the case, and those were the medications she was on. She also had uncorrected vision of 2150 with pinhole potential to 2050. So at this point, we're like, okay, you're motivated. You were not successful with spiral lenses before. You couldn't get them in and out. So what else can we do? What is our goal here? What are we trying to achieve? And again, as I said, failure is when you're not able to meet your goal. So if my goal is that she's going to have independent application removal, that might be a hard goal to set. So what I did, what we all discussed together along with our corneal specialist, was to set the goal to heal the persistent epi defect. That is the fire, so to speak, that we're trying to put out. So this is what the PED looked like. And of course, we ended up fitting her with a lens. For her, I went with a 17 millimeter, did a hyper decay material and minimized thickness as best as I could. And for her, we actually initiated overnight wear, which um, as some of you may be familiar with, and, so, and those of you who are not, spiral lens wear can be indicated for overnight use for the treatment of persistent epi defects, which of course needs to be done very carefully and monitored very closely with appropriate co-management and prophylactic medication. So for this patient, especially given that she was eight years old and the chronicity of the defect, we took utmost caution and we made sure to apply moxifloxacin, one drop per lens application in the les, uh, le lens reservoir, excuse me, and four times a day over the lens as well, just as a prophylactic measure. As I said, we monitored her very closely. In fact, we watched her every day. And what we did, since the patient could not apply and remove, we ended up disinfecting the lens and reapplying it for her daily in office. And we continued to monitor her to see how the cornea would respond. So you can see here by day three and then eventually day five, there was complete resolution of the persistent epi defect, which was very, um, the family was very happy with this result and the vision was 2060. So she still wasn't able to empire and roof, but it didn't matter because we had achieved our goal and this was considered a scleral lens success. So we had a transition back to a bandage soft lens, the cornea remained stable, and her vision was actually just one line reduced compared to what she got with the spiral lens. So honestly, we said, hey, we met our goal. You were successful. You don't need us anymore. You don't need to continue with the spiral lens. And we sent her back to her referring corneal specialist for further management of the VKC. In the future, if she does need a spiral lens or if her vision is not as improved, then we can consider uh, a specialty lens at the appropriate time. So this is, I love this case because, you know, again, if you look back at that slide of what the scleral lens failures were in those different publications, it was based on hours of wear, application removal, et cetera. This patient was still successful with her scleral lens wear, even though she didn't fit the conventional mold of what we constitute as successful. So this is a case of a patient who had poor tolerance with lens wear. 38-year-old Caucasian female, she had history of exposure in the left eye following an acoustic neuroma resection. Her vision was normal in the right as expected, and there was some vision deficit in the left eye at 2050. She tried spiral lenses before but could not really tolerate them because her eye would just get really red. And of course, she was in quite a bit of discomfort and pain because of this degree of exposure. 
So at this point, I'm like, okay, 14.9 millimeter um, lens, and she was getting redness. This is an exposure patient. She had a normal HVID. I wanted to fit just a little bit bigger to try and make sure I had enough coverage of the ocular surface. And I did. I, I went with an 18, which looked okay. I mean, I know the photos are a little bit blurred out and, and a little bit washed out here, but uh, the fit was really well aligned and there was no compression. There was no impingement. There was nothing crazy going on with this, with this lens, but the patient still kept complaining about redness with lens wear. As she looked in these centric rays, it was more evident that she had this very injected uh, looking conjunctiva. She had this nasally as well, but basically this was happening because she had conjunctival exposure. So the reason she wasn't successful with the 14.9 millimeter lens, presumably, was because there wasn't adequate coverage. And even with the 18 millimeter, there wasn't enough coverage. So what do we do now? How do I troubleshoot this? How do I prevent this patient from failing out of this lens and being discouraged to wear it? Well, I decided to go even bigger. So big, I went to a 21 and a half millimeter and it actually worked out beautifully. The conge is just so much more calm. This is a happier looking eye. She still has some wetting defects on the lens if you're wondering, you know, why does it look foggy there? But she really wasn't uh, bothered by that and her vision was excellent. And, you know, the fitting of a lens isn't just how it's aligning to the eye, but how it's covering the eye, um, especially in these exposure cases. So this comes back to understanding the disease as well as understanding the fit of a lens. Here's another case where fit was a challenge in, in being successful. This was a 49-year-old Caucasian male, history of Pellucid, has been wearing corneal GPs for many years, but he was ready to go out of them because they were just dislodging from his eyes constantly and he really couldn't function as well as he wanted to in life. He had tried scarlet lenses before but couldn't tolerate them. They were uncomfortable and it made his eyes red and his vision uh, was 2050 and 2060 with some pinhole improvement potential to 2040. His vision was overall limited by um, refractive amblyopia. So as you're looking at the pictures, you could see some prominent pinguaculums here. And this is what uh, the last set of lenses that he had been fit with. So he would say how close to his nose, especially would get very red. So as you're looking here in those circled areas, this is obviously impingement over the pinguaculums. And that is the variable here. So how do we troubleshoot this? Well, you can fit around it by doing notches. That may, uh, that may be one way to go. Some of you may, may have been in these situations before and that's how you do it. Or you can actually fit over the pinguaculas. I am much more in favor of fitting over because it just covers more of the conjunctival tissue to prevent desiccation. Pinguaculas are already delicate tissue. And I just, whenever I can, I just want to provide as much support, physical barrier and, and coverage to the ocular surface with the lens as I can in areas that need to be covered. So by fitting in a larger diameter lens for that right eye, I went to an 18.5 and that was sufficient. And for the left eye, it did have a little bit more of a prominent pinguacula, so I went a little bit bigger and I went to a 19.5. And what I added in addition for the left eye is I added a little back surface, what, what we call in our lenses is a channel. And that's kind of what it looks like if you were to remove this lens from the patient's eye and look at it. But basically it's just a back surface excavated area that it serves as a pocket for the anatomical obstacle to sit under or for it to rest over the anatomical obstacle. So with this, the patient was successful. He was happy. He was in getting 2040, his pinhole vision, and wearing them 16 hours a day, no less. I mean, that's a generous amount of time, and he was very comfortable with this. This is a case of a 72-year-old Caucasian female with history of Sjogren's and cicatricial changes. This was a quite severe Sjogren's patient. She had cataracts that were progressing worse than the left and the right. She had been a long-term spiral lens patient of mine at this point. She came in complaining of visually debilitating fogging with her lenses. She always had fogging before, but with her cataracts progressing, it just got too visually significant for her. So her vision was reduced at 2100 and 2060. She was only able to wear them six to eight hours a day. And that's with reapplying them where she would remove, rinse the debris off and put them back in. She was already using a hydrogen peroxide cleaning system, which, which we find to be the most favorable in these patients. And we had tried Hydropeg in the past and she had failed with that. So this is what she looked like. I will say this is definitely one of the more severe cases of debris accumulation I've seen in my patients. 
But for her, it wasn't really that surprising if you understand what the condition is. She has Sjogren's. She doesn't produce enough tears. She's still producing enough mucus, plenty of mucus. She has cicatricial lid changes, so she can't blink completely. So what happens is her eyes producing oil, producing debris, not enough tears, and it's just accumulating around this lens and she can't blink it away. So what we did as a solution for this patient was, okay, you're just removing and rinsing your lenses right now. Let's add a special type of conditioner for you that may enhance the wetting of your lenses and you'll continue to do replenishing in the middle of the day. So we went for the Boston Original Reconditioning Solution, which I highly recommend. It's been a game changer for a lot of my patients. And this is what she looked like after wearing the lenses the same number of hours of wear. You can see the gross irregular lid anatomy, um, which of course posed a variable for her. She can't blink all the way, which caused the debris accumulation. But um, these pictures were actually taken after she eventually had cataract surgery. But nonetheless, before she even had cataract surgery, she was on the same regimen and it was working just as well. So this patient we prevented from going into star lens failure by troubleshooting the fogging issue she was having. She still has debris, it's still, she still has wetting defects, but it is so much more manageable for her. This is a case I actually wrote for Global Insight, Contamax Global Insight. It's available online if you ever want to reference it. It's a 54-year-old Caucasian female who was struggling with her vision. She has keratoconus, was a habitual spiral lens wearer. She was really suffering from poor vision and what she described as ghosting or shadowing. And she had started a new job, an administrative role, which warranted a lot of computer work. And she just couldn't make out the numbers or the font on the screen. So this was very visually devastating for her in her everyday life. It was at a point where she's like, doc, I have to consider surgery. There's really nothing else for me to do. But before we consider that, I said, look, Mrs. Jones, let me see what I can do to try and improve your vision as best as I can, because you can always move forward from surgery, but you can't come back from it. So let's see what we can do. So I leaned on the old uh, aberometer to help me out here. Now, I will say before I did this, I did try to screen for sill. I did do an over refraction. I could not get her to budge anywhere from her entering acuity. I didn't get anywhere near her pinhole vision. So with the aberrometer, it, uh, I suspected that she was getting a lot of aberrations, high order aberrations as many ectasia patients do. So looking at the aberrometry scans, and you don't have to understand what these terms and stuff mean. All you have to understand is that the magnitude of the bar you're looking at signifies the significance of the aberration. So obviously with the left eye, the image on the right is far more progressed than the right eye, which reflects uh, the severity of her keratoconus at baseline. But despite the left being far worse than the right, she was still very symptomatic in both eyes. So the problem was she's not happy with her vision and she's getting a lot of residual aberrations. What can we do about this? Is there anything that we can do to improve upon this so that she may prevent surgery and we can prevent scleral lens failure? Well, yes, you could do custom wavefront optics to correct for high order aberrations. This is a meaty topic. This is a lot to cover, and we don't have the time for that today. I could go three hours just talking about aberrations alone, but I won't. <laughs> so, you know, just for the sake of completeness, so that you understand your patients and what to do if they come in with this problem, know that they, you sh there are other options available, and you may be able to exhaust alternatives and elevate your fitting technology or the um, capability that you may have may change with the different lab you're using, that may prevent your patients from going to the surgical approach. But anyhow, I digress. Focusing back on this case, I did exactly that. I went for custom wavefront optics, where basically we're, we're taking their HOA profile and we're incorporating to the front of the lens. And with that, what you're looking at here, the, the screenshots on the top are the before with her conventional star lens of what her aberrations were. And on the bottom, you can see that her aberration significantly reduced. And this was reflected also by her visual acuity. So we got pretty darn close, actually matched her visual acuity almost exactly. I'm sorry, her pinhole visual acuity almost exactly. Right eye got to 20, 20 minus one, left eye 20, 25 minus one. So you can see again, the images on the top are before and the images on the bottom are after. This is a visual representation of how the patient looked out into the world. 
and their significant clinical improvement. So without having access to this technology or without even being aware, if I didn't have access to this, I would consider referring them to somebody who did or consider, I would just get on the phone with my lab and say, hey lab, do you guys have this technology available? What can I do? And by doing this, by taking it to that next level, you can significantly help um, your patients and have them prevent more uh, aggressive treatments. Getting down to the last couple of cases here before we sum it up. This is a case of a patient who had poor physiologic function and tolerance with lens wear. 46 year old female with keratoconus, has a relatively aged corneal transplant, more than 25 years, habitual scar lens wear in both eyes, really was doing okay with the left eye and the non-transplant eye. But the right eye, she was wearing it still 10 hours, but she was starting to get some discomfort with the lens. She would say, doc, when I remove the lens, it feels achy. It just doesn't feel as good as it did. So we're looking at the lens, thinking back to the slides earlier on, right? You look at this eye, you're like, well, gee, okay. Um, it doesn't look terrible. It doesn't look like there's, I know you can't see the details very much, but take my word for it. There was really no significant impingement. There was no compression. The eye looked quiet. It looked happy. So I took a little closer look and what did I find here? Hmm, well, that's not normal. That looks like there's some pockets of bullet there in the host tissue. Adjacent to that more towards the center or towards the graft itself, you can also appreciate some microcystic edema as well. So, all right, the eye may not look that angry. Yes, there's definitely pockets of bullet there, but of course, even if this wasn't here, I would remove the lens. I wanna get a full view. And when I remove this lens, you can see in the image on the far left, that's the nasal graft host junction. Um, actually, there, there's edema there and it spills over to the graft as well. And the images on the right, there's a diffuse fluorescein image as well as an eccentric gaze fluorescein image. And you can see there's significant edema in the peripheral aspect of the cornea with some inferior involvement of the corneal transplant. So this patient's problem is that she has hypoxia and poor endothelial, just hypoxia from the lens, coupled with the fact that she has what seems to be poor endothelial function in a transplanted eye. So what do you do for this patient? Do you send them out for surgery? She wasn't ready for that. Um, or, or do you try to fix the lens in some way? So for this patient, again, we took it the next step above. We thought about what else can we do to prevent a more aggressive treatment for you? And that was to add a fenestration to increase oxygenation or oxygen ventilation, as we call it, and also to provide some relief of suction because we know that a fenestration can do both. Now, again, this is very general explanation, but the point of this case and, and what I'm going to show you is the outcome here is that you're aware there are other options and not all your spiral lens failures are truly failures. They just may need modifications. We added some fenestrations. Um, there's actually three you can see here, three, six, and nine at each of those mid-peripheral corneal zones. There's a uh, fenestration. This is a little bit of a closer look with fluorescein. I think that highlights it a little bit more nicely. We can see the fourth fenestration there on the superior aspect. And what you're looking at is a bubble um, that is actually traveling between the different fenestration points. So the nice part with this lens, it actually did the trick. It actually took care of the corneal edema and improved her average wear time, maintained her vision at 20-20, and she's doing fine ever since. So this was another patient on her route to spiral lens failure, and we were able to salvage it. And last but not least, I'll, uh, I'm going to end with this case. It's a case of a patient who had redness with lens wear. I think all of us who fit scleral lenses have encountered some uh, patients like this in some way, shape, or form. Keratoconus, dry eye, primary open angle glaucoma with history of steroid response, was wearing his scleral lenses 20 hours a day. And he was sent because he was just not happy with the scleral lenses he had, and he was taking latanoprostin each eye. So entering again, I apologize for the images being a bit washed out here, but you can see there's some injection here, maybe some degree of medicamentosa from the prostaglandin he's on, um, but there's limbal hyperemia. It just, it doesn't look like a very happy eye. Moreover, when you're looking at the lens, it doesn't look bad. I mean, maybe it looks a, a little snug, but I think if, yeah, it really doesn't look that bad. But as I've said before, and I'll say again and again, you, your lens assessment is not done. You are not done looking at how the lens is actually fitting or functioning until you've removed the lens. So I removed the lens and you can see there's significant edge staining 
Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the white light images here, but he did also have significant rebound injection. So these lenses are fitting tight and they are suctioning. So certainly there was room for improvement for fitting. So I thought, great, I can do this, no problem. Let's have you come back. We'll fit you with the lenses. I'm hopeful that your tolerance of wear will be better. That looks like there's clear room for improvement here, but let's just take it one day at a time. We'll do our best. So like I said, I refit him and he got to 2020. We didn't change anything to his medication uh, and he did feel better, but to my disappointment, his eyes were more red. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I refit you, you should be doing better. The fit looks better, you are happier. You're in this large loose lens, what is going on? So at this point, you know, I removed the lens again, true to form, I wanna get a full understanding of how this lens is functioning. And there was no edge staining, maybe a little bit superior nasal on that bottom photo of the left eye, but really nothing. And there was no rebound hyperemia. The eye was just red with the lens on. So what is it? Did I, I mean, nothing else changed. Is the fit just that bad? Is it contact lens over? Is it ocular surface disease? Is it the medicamentosa? What is going on? What I did for this patient is gave him options. Look, there's no way to exactly isolate what's happening. You did have baseline level of inflammation. We know that to be true, but I also know you wear your lenses 20 hours a day. You know, you went from wearing one lens to another and you never took a break. So maybe it's time to get a lens holiday and just like calm things down. He was not amendable to that at all. This man could not accommodate this for his life. So we said, okay, that's out the door. We can't do this. And can we add a steroid to calm it down? Well, he has history of steroid response and I checked his pressure and it was 28 and 30. So what do we do now? I started him on uh, lefitogras twice a day and I just was trying to calm down the oculus surface inflammation. Didn't make any changes to the lens. I really was not feeling that this was lens related at all. And I referred back to the provider who had referred him to us and we said, hey, listen, the pressure's kind of high. See if you can manage that better. So, or, or you can manage to bring the pressure down, excuse me. And so we didn't make any lenses, uh, lens changes and he comes back. This was just two or three weeks later and he looks significantly better. You know, we didn't change the fit. He actually went and had his pressure checked again, checked again and it was okay. Um, they saw him again at some point down the line and I think they added Timolol, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, that's not the point of this case here. The point is he had redness with lens wear that worsened even though I fit him in a better lens or seemingly better fit. And instead of chasing the fit, I recognize that this might be underlying inflammation just from contact lens overwear, medicamentosa, what have you, and adding a topical therapy um, without affecting his glaucoma pressures really was the way to go. So with that, some closing thoughts to keep in mind, you know, set appropriate goals and expectations at each consult visit really set the roots down for what you're trying to achieve with your patients and have that dialogue to set yourself up for success. Always remove the lens to assess the ocular health response. Understand that having a thorough understanding of the underlying disease is essential to scleral lens success. Elevate your scleral lens practice fitting techniques, reach out to your lab consultants, see what they're able to do. And lastly, of course, get creative because scleral lens fitting is a wonderful thing. And the way you're able to impact patients' lives is, is really a joy. And you have the ability to get creative with them. Patients appreciate it. And there's a lot more answers there than you may realize in some cases when you reach out for a uh, consult to get some other answers or some other opinions. And with that, I say thank you very much. Thanks for listening in. I hope you enjoyed. Have a good rest of your day. Great. That was such an awesome lecture by Bitta. Um, if we did not get to answer your question in the chat, the live chat, um, feel free to send her an email. I pasted her email over there. Um, just a couple other comments. If you do intend on getting CE credit, I hope that you've already done the pre-test. Those, you will have to do a post-test tomorrow. It'll be available at 3.20 Pacific time. It'll be open for a while, so you'll have some time to do it. Um, and one thing you might not know is that Eyes on Eye Care actually has a wine sponsor. So Jessup Sellers is sponsoring. They are the official vendor of wine for Eyes on Eye Care. Um, I am so excited to open this Pinot Noir later. They have a booth over in the exhibit hall, so feel free to jump over there, check out their wines. Uh, they have some great holiday packages. So I will be opening this up after our next lecture.